So we're going to start this off with um, Karen Imus, hopefully saying her name right, who is the Vice President of Programs at the Waterfront Alliance. And along with her is Tyler Taba, who's the Senior Man Manager for Climate Policy also at the Waterfront Alliance. So we're very excited to hear about what they're doing on comprehensive resilience. So go right ahead. Thank you so much, Holly, and good afternoon. Uh, good morning still, everyone, and a pleasure to be with you at the SWIM Coalition, uh, with, with Pratt, and with uh, a lot of familiar faces and some new faces I see in the Zoom. So really excited to be here with you um, today. And myself and my colleague, uh, Tyler, are going to um, walk you through uh, sort of a broad view of uh, comprehensive climate resilience um, strategies and advocacy priorities that Waterfront Alliance has been working on. And we'll talk a little bit about the intersection of um, climate resilience and stormwater resilience. I think Tyler is going to share the screen yes, here. Yes, I am. I am just going to share it in just one second. Great. And we'll get started. Okay. Um, can everybody see the presentation? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Great. So um, next slide, please, Tyler. Yes. Thanks. So we'll start with a little bit about uh, who we are. Uh, Waterfront Alliance is an advocacy organization by state working in New York and New Jersey that focuses on resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. We were created about 15 years ago uh, in New York at a time when there was a lot of rapid and dramatic change along the city's waterfronts with new development, water quality uh, needs, um, a focus on nature uh, and ecology, and a focus on uh, new open space and green space priorities. And the, the confluence of all of those sort of mixed uses and challenges and opportunities that kind of bump up against each other kind of formed um, uh, Waterfront Alliance. Next slide, please. And just to walk you through a little bit um, about our, our coastlines and waterfronts, as you know, New York City has 520 miles of, of waterfront, so certainly no shortage of, of issues to focus on. Um, uh, the sort of uh, historic uh, vision of what Manhattan looked like uh, centuries ago is a much more natural one. and. Uh, we're obviously seeing a refocusing on those kinds of priorities uh, in resilience planning today. Next slide, please. Uh, in the last several hundred years during colonization, New York became increasingly um, commercial, uh, obviously a global trade capital. Uh, Waterfront Alliance focuses on the maritime sector and the working waterfront quite a bit uh, as well. And even though uh, a lot of that has moved over to New Jersey and elsewhere around the region. Uh, the importance of our harbor as a, uh, as a trade uh, uh, capital, a trade route, uh, continues to, to be critical. And there are clearly connections and implications to climate resilience and how our uh, shorelines are maintained for, for commercial use. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, the post-industrial waterfront. So as a lot of the manufacturing and, and trade moved away from, from our water's edges, this is what um, a lot of Manhattan's coastline and, and Brooklyn's coastline looked like uh, throughout the 70s. Uh, and uh, a lot of the you know, contamination in our waterways that we're still dealing with today, a result of, uh, of this period of time. Next slide, please. And then in the last you know, 30 years or so, we've seen increased access to waterways, um, well, while imperfect, certainly starting to open up a new chapter in the city's history, bringing New Yorkers back to the water's edge. Um, uh, a lot of these efforts have been led by uh, small citizen groups who've done uh, things like water quality, uh, put uh, kayaks in, in the water before, uh, you know, kayaking was popular again. Um, and really, you know, kind of opened up um, the, the, the waterways uh, once again. And, you know, what you, what you see here in, in this picture is kind of this confluence of images that shows concrete esplanade and still, uh, you know, fences and barriers, um, which while, while certainly improving, um, still remains um, a barrier in some places across the city. Next slide, please. 
this is a more kind of you know contemporary uh, version of what we see across some waterfronts. Uh, we've coined sort of the term esplanadia to describe the uh, kind of uh, the trend of the concrete esplanade, which while again has brought New Yorkers to the water's edge from a sort of eco ecological uh, and climate resilience point of view uh, is probably not, not necessarily the best approach. Um, next slide, please. And today we're starting to see um, a, an evolution of these trends and Waterfront Alliance has been uh, at the core of really advocating for the best outcomes for the water's edge. Um, you see that natural features like the beach uh, highlighted here, like the soft edge shoreline, uh, contribute to a lot of co-benefits, uh, recreation, climate resilience, water quality. Um, and, you know, we're able to do this as an organization. I can go to the next slide, Tyler, thank you. Um, we're able to do this as an organization, as a constituency, of working with more than um, a thousand partners that are advocating for the best outcomes at, at the water's edge. And clearly today, underlying um, anything that we're doing at the coastline is really the issue of, of climate change. And there are all of the factors of heavy precipitation, sea level rise, heat, et cetera, that are coming together to place extraordinary challenges on how we plan, how we build, uh, how we interact with nature. Uh, next slide, please. And so some of our advocacy priorities at Waterfront Alliance in working with stakeholders uh, like the SWIM Coalition, in working with our government officials, focus on how to advance um, resilient policies, investments, uh, land use planning uh, that will protect uh, New York City's communities. Next slide, please. The open harbor and public access also remains uh, a huge priority for the Waterfront Alliance, making sure that New Yorkers can enjoy the water's edge, actually get um, out on the water. Uh, we recently actually had some interesting conversations with some stakeholders about how we define uh, open space uh, in the city and referring to not just green space, but blue space as well, because um, being at the waterfront is one aspect, but actually being on the water uh, is really uh, an important part of what we describe as public access. Next slide, please. Education and programming, which is a critical part of our agenda as well. Uh, and that is, you know, focusing on bringing young people to the water's edge in their communities and, um, you know, familiarizing them with really what does water quality uh, look like? Uh, what are some STEM things that they can learn? Um, and understanding geography, topography, um, basic climate resilience 101, which is still, I think, in sort of the educational sphere, a really, you know, growing, growing need and, and growing space. Next slide, please. Uh, and as I mentioned, the working harbor and maritime industry, which is evolving and growing with uh, what will, you know, be the offshore wind industry coming into the harbor in the coming years, um, and how that will evolve with port infrastructure, um, what that will look like at the water's edge and what will be the impact in the water for marine habitat, water quality. Uh, and this will be a whole new chapter for what um, the working harbor looks like uh, in New York. Next slide, please. And I will pause here and turn it over to Tyler, who's going to dig a little deeper into our um, resilience advocacy priority and the work that we're doing specifically to help communities across New York, um, to help our most vulnerable communities adapt uh, to a future of climate change. Go ahead, Tyler. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I don't know if I'm yes. muted. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I'm gonna take some time to go over the Rise to Resilience Coalition, who we are, what we're fighting for, and some of the challenges ahead of us. Uh, Waterfront Alliance advocates for waterfront issues in several ways, but a big thrust of our advocacy is through the Rise to Resilience Coalition. And at its core, the Rise to Resilience Coalition is, um, is a coalition of residents, leaders in business, labor, justice, volunteer organizations, scientists, environmental advocates, and design professionals collectively calling uh, on our federal, state, and local governments to make building climate resilience an urgent priority. Since our inception, uh, Rise to Resilience has grown to over 100 organizations in the New York, New Jersey Harbor region, and we're made up of large national organizations that you've all probably heard of, like NRDC, Environmental Defense Fund, and the Nature Conservancy, 
to more local grassroots organizations like Regional Ready Rockaway, Coney Island Unification Project. Um, Rise to Resilience is also made up of three active working groups. We have a New York, New Jersey, and federal working group. And as you'd imagine, each of these groups is working to address resilience and adaptation strategies for their respective names. So why is this work important? Why do we need resilience? Well, to start, there's over a million New Yorkers in the floodplain, and this number is gonna to continue to grow as sea levels rise. And of these roughly 1.3 million people in the floodplain, more than half of them are low-income communities. It's important to note that the floodplain is diverse. It's a mix of natural and built environment. Uh, we we're talking about homes, businesses, industry, parks, all kinds of different makeups. Uh, the social, economic, and human cost is tremendous. And these areas often face unique and different flood risks that require localized strategies to make them resilient. Hey, Tyler, could you zoom in on the slides more? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, or, uh, Somebody said, oh, I want to see the great pictures. Ask him if he can zoom in on the slides more. Sorry about that. No, let me see. Why is it not working? I think you, if, you just, if you just go to slideshow in the menu. Um, slideshow. And so the, yes. Play from current slide. Yes. Okay. So just give me one second then. Sorry, one second. Sorry to take you off your flow there. Yeah. Tyler, if it's helpful, I can bring up the presentation and share it as well. Would you like me to do that? I think that's a good idea, Karen. Okay, let me I'll, see. I'll, let me I'll see. Share full screen, right? Yeah. And speak yeah. at the same time. Yeah, sorry. Let me just uh, do my best here to pull it up. Uh, can you all can you all see the uh, deck right now? Oh yeah, that looks good. Yeah. All right. Let me just bring it to where Tyler was. Yes, I was on. I think public housing slide eighteen. I'm sorry about that. Not, no. Oh, problem. you're fine, Tyler. We just wanted to get the most okay. out of your amazing. Yes. Slides. Yeah. So, okay. you know, <laughs> I will. I will be the clicker. Go for it. Okay. Tyler. Perfect. Thank it, you so much. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're talking about the diverse, um, all the diverse different areas in the floodplain. And so speaking of homes. There's about one in 10 uh, public housing developments in New York City that are currently in the floodplain. So the city's aging stock of affordable units needs to be retrofitted to withstand uh, these extreme weather events that we're facing. Things like elevated boilers, building backup generators and placing electric equipment on roofs as well as more green infrastructure. So something must be done either to relocate the thousands of low income residents living in the flood prone areas um, and experiencing regular flooding or to upgrade their homes. Next, we know that nature is also at risk. You can go to the next slide. Yes. So nature is also at risk. There is 106 square miles of wetlands that could be inundated and lost in New York City by 2100. Um, the Super Bowl is this Sunday. So just for reference, that would be 52,000 football fields. In the past century um, alone, we've seen roughly 85% of the coastal wetlands lost in New York and New Jersey harbor estuaries. Uh, and well over 90% of the freshwater wetlands in New York City have been lost. Next slide. So obviously uh, there's, there's diverse, these diverse areas across the floodplain are at risk, uh, but why, what are the risks? So uh, we know that there's a full range of climate threats and you can see some of those projections here like coastal storms, sea level rise, temperatures, and the common threat trend here is extreme, meaning that these events are gonna become more intense and in, more, in most cases more frequent as a result of climate change. Um, a theme that I'd like to keep in mind throughout this presentation is that how we deal with climate risks dovetails with how we prepare for stormwater challenges. We have to always be looking at co-benefits to promote um, resilience. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go over some of these more specific um, climate risks that we face in New York. So starting with uh, coastal storms, the projections for New York are more frequent and more intense storms. And this includes both tropical storms like hurricanes and cyclones, as well as Nor'easterners. And, Warming oceans and atmospheres uh, lead to more intense precipitation and extreme weather, extreme winds, excuse me, during these storm events. And something important to note is that the combination of coastal storms and high tides can actually lead to significant flooding and beach erosion. And this is what we saw during Hurricane Sandy. So because of New York's co complex coastline, uh, there's often variation in the extent of timing and flooding associated with a, a particular storm. So 
in the case of Sandy, again, uh, the reason that coastal flooding was so devastating in southern parts of New York uh, were because was because the peak storm surge occurred uh, during high tide. Next, we have sea level rise. So sea level rise in New York City is projected to exceed the global average. And there's several factors for why sea levels rise in New York City. And um, most of them can be attributed to thermal expansion, ice mass loss, and glacial isostatic adjustments. So thermal expansion refers to uh, oceans warming as they expand, or sorry, um, oceans, ocean waters expanding as they warm. Um, ice mass loss refers to the addition of fresh water into the ocean when glaciers and land-based ice melts. And glacial isostatic is this ongoing slow response to the last deglaciation uh, causing local land subsidence. And um, this poses, a, this poses a growing hazards to much of our region's coastal population. There's a, lot, there's a lot of infrastructure and people and other built and natural assets in low-lying areas. Uh, this next slide here will show you that the projections for New York City are about eight to 30 inches of sea level rise by 2050 and as much as 15 to 75 inches by 2100. And this map on the right here shows uh, monthly tidal flooding based on scenarios of sea level rise for 2020, 2050, 2080, and 2100. And there's actually even more extreme scenarios based on Antarctic rapid ice melt. This is just something that scientists have kind of been struggling to project how quickly the Antarctic ice sheets are going to melt. And if they quick, if they melt quicker than anticipated, we could see even up to 114 inches of sea level rise by 2100. So moving on to precipitation. Precipitation is a serious risk in New York City, and it's something that we've seen pretty recently. Um, Precipitation is expected to increase from 4 to 11% by 2050 and up to 25% by 2100. And these precipitation increases are expected to be largest during the winter months. Um, something we've already seen, like I mentioned, is this intense and extreme rain over short periods of time, which is known as cloudburst. Um, and these cloudburst rain events are really dangerous because they overburden our infrastructure and dump a lot of rain, more than our pipes can handle, um, pipes and catch basins can handle. And, this often leads to street flooding, MTA flooding, and even home flooding. And it's mostly because New York City's infrastructure is old and not really designed for these kind of more intense climate projections. And that's why we see them overburdened so often. Um, by 2080, a third of New York City's roadways could be impacted by extreme rainfall. And this would be about 2,700 miles of roadways and 150 miles of bridges, highways, and tunnels. And that's important because those are you know, critical infrastructure points for New Yorkers. Also by 2080, um, oh, sorry, one more slide back. Yes, also by 2080, uh, as many as 1.4 million residential units, which is also the equivalent of 40% of the city's total residential units across the city can be exposed to access-based impacts from extreme rainfall. So access-based impact just refers to residents being able to access their apartment or home. And this map shows the percentage of residential units exposed to extreme rainfall access impacts. And while many of these units on the ground floor and basements are most exposed and to direct damages from flooding. Um, residents living on upper floors and multi-story structures can also find themselves temporarily inaccessible if extreme rainfall projections are um, continue to grow. And the last one that I'll talk about is temperature. So summer temperatures, which is just the months of June, July, and August are expected to increase through the 21st century, which is gonna lead to more frequent and intense heat events known as heat waves, which is just three or more consecutive days at or above 90 degrees. Um, these extreme heat events are exacerbated by the urban heat island effect. Extreme heat also disproportionately impacts vulnerable and marginalized communities. Uh, areas home to low-income communities of color closely overlap with areas of high heat. And extreme heat, something we know that disproportionately impacts Black New Yorkers, low-income and low-wealth communities, older adults, and workers in affected industries like construction and manufacturing. And something that's important for this um, for the SWIM Coalition and for this presentation in specific is that areas with less vegetation and more impervious surfaces are also most exposed to high temperatures, which is a good segue to this next slide. So for comprehensive resilience, we really need to be sure that we're looking at the full suite of solutions to protect people, um, infrastructure, and nature. Many of the efforts that we've heard about today uh, are connected to resiliency efforts. Green infrastructure like green roofs, rain gardens, permeable pavements and wetlands, as well as green infrastructure solutions like modernizing our sewer system, all have co-benefits that are tied to resilience. And these co-benefits are really key to the solutions of building a more equitable and resilient New York. And speaking of investing in resilience, um, along with the co-benefits, it's important to note that resilience investments pay off in the long run. 
half of the U.S. population lives on the coast, meaning there's a hun- there's hundreds of millions of people who face similar risks and challenges that we do here in New York. And investing upfront saves money in the long term. The National Institute of Building Science has actually reported that there's a four to one cost benefit ratio when it comes to designing to building code and a six to one ratio when it comes to protecting against storm surge. So how does this tie into rise to resilience and what are some of the priorities that we have to promote resiliency in New York? Uh, Well, one major item is the implementation of Local Law 122, which is the Five Borough Climate Adaptation Plan. And this is hugely important because it focuses on neighborhood planning in environmental justice communities. And I'm definitely gonna come back to this one. We're also working on securing funding and maintenance and resiliency uh, across NYCHA housing. NYCHA has a massive footprint in our city and it's, uh, there's a real need for more green infrastructure uh, across their projects. Flood disclosure legislation is something that our coalition has also been working really hard on. Um, New York state has one of the weakest flood disclosure bills in the countries, and that leaves renters and buyers unaware of the risks they might face when they move into their new home. So we're working on getting a new bill passed that would um, eliminate a loophole where buyers or a, a sellers don't have to disclose this information. And uh, there's also uh, there's also a lot of wetlands uh, expansion protection work that's been going on with other coalitions as well as the Rise to Resilience Coalition. There's currently a million acres of wetlands in New York State that DEC does not have jurisdiction over because of outdated maps and policies. And so we've been um, pushing the state assembly and Senate uh, as well as Governor Hochul to include this um, in their in their state budget uh, and basically expand protection to to these um, to these wetlands. There's a few other things that I can talk about later in the Q and A, maybe like one percent for parks and the mayor's Adam budget, um, a, a launch of a homeowner resilience retrofit incentive program, environmental bond act, and uh, lots of other stuff across the city and state. But I do want to go to Adapt NYC, which is that local law 122 that I was talking about. So Adapt NYC is a five borough climate is part of this five borough climate adaptation plan that I mentioned. It would be a strategic plan for climate adaptation in New York City that the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency is working on, and we're hoping to see this come out later in 2022. Working with different agency partners, the Mayor's Office um, will work to evaluate the relative the relative impacts um, of New York City's multiple climate hazards, like the ones that I just discussed before: coastal storms, sea level rise, high temperatures, precipitation as well as evaluating and incorporating the latest findings in climate science and best practices and building consensus around a climate adaptation strategy for the short, medium and long term. And you can see some of the goals for this plan on the slide. And there's one in particular that I really wanna focus on and that's on the next slide, which is neighborhood planning. So just like in the floodplain, um, adaptation doesn't look the same everywhere. Neighborhood planning is really important for New York City because it gets down to the specific issues and areas of concern that different neighborhoods face. Um, having gone through neighborhood planning efforts, communities will be in a much better place to secure federal funding for shovel-ready projects because they'll already have identified what types of projects their community needs. And this level of hyper-local planning also gives voices to communities who can bring awareness to issues like stormwater flooding and other climate-related issues that they face in their community. And we really want to make sure that this is not an unfunded mandate. This has to be a long-term ongoing process that takes sustained uh, engagement. And ADAPT NYC really has the potential to be the foundation or backbone of resiliency in New York City. So what's our goal? Um, At Waterfront Alliance, we believe that to improve the health of all of our regions and people and environment, we have to have clear leadership, approach the problem holistically and fund and finance community-based projects uh, in a way that's transparent and prioritizes equity and justice in everything we do. Especially in our highly vulnerable and urbanized region, we believe that changes to our system, including transportation, construction, zoning, land use, energy, they all need to take place. Um, And we have to recommit to climate preparedness, connect people with the water and see nature as what takes or, or what makes our community whole. And there's no single solution. It's really important to note that when we talk about climate change, the solutions for South Queens will look different than the solutions for Bronx that will look different for the solutions of the Lower East Side. And New York City is home to 520 miles of coastline, and there's not this one size fits all solution for all five boroughs, which I think goes back to the point of neighborhood planning being so important. I'd like to take a few minutes just to talk about some of the accomplishments that Rise to Resilience and the Waterfront Alliance have had. Um, one of the big ones is securing this funding for the um, the Harbor and Tributary Study by the Army Corps. We've also provided extensive comments to FEMA. As, a develop, as the agency develops plans for climate adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and community resilience. And here in New York City, uh, we fought for 
the permanent funding of the mayor's office of resiliency, as well as the passage of the fibro adaptation plan that I mentioned and the climate resiliency design guidelines bill, just to name a few. We've also been um, sustained in our engagement with New York leaders. On the next slide, you can see that um, we put forth a set of recommendations to Mayor Adams for his first 100 days. And we actually saw several of these recommendations included in his climate resilience plan. At the state level, we shared a memo with Governor Hochul on climate resilience priorities for 2022, focused on six areas of, uh, six major topic areas. And all of this is done together with the Rise to Resilience Coalition. So a lot of this is informed, we sign on together. And so these are just a few of kind of like the main items that we've been working on and accomplishments that we had. And I'm actually gonna pass it to Karen to go over another thing that Waterfront Alliance does that's very relevant for stormwater and just resiliency as a whole. And that's our wedge program, so Karen. Thank you so much, Tyler. And uh, we'll just take 60 seconds on this. Um, Tyler talked through kind of big picture policy, what the, what the city, the state, the federal government can do. Um, the, there's a really technical piece to how we design and innovate at, at the water's edge. And while the city uh, has actually uh, developed many programs and plans through the Department of City Planning, through the Department of Buildings to ensure a high standard of waterfront development and design, uh, what we found is that um, rating systems and standards like LEED, for example, that have set extraordinarily high building standards we're really missing in the resilience and adaptation space. And Waterfront Alliance created a program called the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines that sets a high standard for resilience, ecology, and public access at the water's edge for public and private projects. It's a, at its core, a rating system and set of guidelines. You can see six categories here. And this is actually open source on our website. And you can go to wedge.waterfrontalliance.org to take a look. And I think that some of the key categories here edge resilience, natural resources, uh, community access and connections, really envision a water's edge that is more natural, more accessible for the public, individuals physically getting in the water, that creates um, more vegetation, that uses shade and addresses those issues that Tyler laid out, the precipitation, the extreme heat, the sea level rise, the storm surge, and really prepares projects uh, whether it's housing, a park, an industrial site, to you know, both literally and figuratively weather the storm. These are wedge verified projects that have um, gone through the process that have been that have passed, have been rated highly. You'll see most of these are in the New York, New Jersey region, but we've started to expand nationally and just recently verified a project in North Carolina. Um, we've also taken wedge. Um, to different um, institutions like community boards and um, uh, kind of, kind of quasi-government entities like the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which are embedding these in climate design guidelines. Uh, and so there's a huge opportunity here to set a high standard, but also to create sort of continuity, right? Because as you all know, there are many projects across the water's edge that are private. And each, and each parcel can start to look really substantially different from the parcel next to it. And what does that mean for resilience? And what does that mean for public access? Um, and so what we're hoping to see is really continuity. This helps with things like greenways, with transportation, um, and really to set that, that standard high. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you for, for your time. We'll post a couple of links in the chat to the documents that Tyler mentioned on our uh, resilience and waterfront platform for the next mayor for the city council. And uh, we look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you both. That was fascinating. Um, great to, to hear about some of the issues and then move on to some of these um, wonderful solutions.